I was taking the reverse journey to go to Tibet to fight China. एक किस्म से अभी अभी देखिए तो ऐसा लग रहा है कि वो मरने जा रहे हैं क्योंकि वहां मरने के सिवा कोई चांस ही नहीं है यू आर इमिनेंटली गोइंग टू बी अरेस्टेड बीटन टॉर्चर्ड एंड किल्ड एंड येट देर वॉज दिस गाय हु इज ट्वेंटी टू ईयर्स ओल्ड एंड फ्रेश कॉलेज ग्रेजुएट सर फिरा जा रहे हैं तिब्बत भगत सिंह की शपथ लेके बिल्कुल भगत सिंह ने वही किया ना कि अपने देश के लिए जान कुर्बान करना और इस बिलीफ में था कि उन्होंने कहा कि मेरे जाने के बाद मेरे खून की हर बूंद से एक नया क्रांतिकारी उभर के आएंगे बिलीफ दैट माय लाइफ फॉर द कंट्री विल गिव राइज टू अ न्यू रेवोल्यूशन एंड आई वाज इन दैट बिलीफ सो आई वेंट टू एंड व्हेन आई वेंट टू बैट आई वॉज अरेस्टेड बीटन टॉर्चर्ड jailed and in the jail i i met tibetan freedom fighters tibetan freedom fighters who had never known the freedom in india they have never known the support we are getting in india and different other countries they have no idea and yet they don't give up see their imagination of support and freedom i i cannot imagine where do they seek inspiration when is so limited for them tibet the roof of the world has been under oppressive rule seemingly by china for more than 60 years calling for worldwide attention and concerns regarding the plight of tibetans and regarding this i recently came across tenzin sundu a tibetan activist fighting for the freedom of tibet and when i read his story to be really honest it personally motivated the hell out of me like this man has been arrested more than 16 times by indian authorities just because of peaceful activism and he has devoted his whole life for tibetan independence his value system his principles his belief in humanity literally moved me in tears while on camera Hello everyone welcome to the Jain Bharat show and today we are sitting with Mr Tenjin Sundu thank you so much sir for coming to our show we are very happy that you are, we are sitting here today with you namaste <laughs> namaste <laughs> namaste so first question to you is who is Tenjin Sundu in his own words uh Tenjin Sundu is a Tibetan refugee uh living in india uh, born here uh, educated here raised in india uh, i'm a writer mm. uh, make my living out of writing uh, it's a small amount of writing um, but nonetheless by the sales of that uh, writing i make my living mm, i'm an activist hum tibet ki azadi ke liye kaam kar raha hu aur pichle 25 saalon se yahi kar kar raha hu और मैं चाहता हूं कि तिब्बत आज़ाद हो और हम अपने देश तिब्बत वापस जा पाए दैट इज माय बेसिक गोल ऑफ लाइफ सो दैट इज थिंग्स यू डू यू जस्ट सेड कि आप यू आर अ रेफ्यूजी बोर्न इन इंडिया सो कैन यू डिस्क्राइब कि हाउ हार्ड वाज इट लाइक फॉर योर पेरेंट्स फॉर फॉर बीइंग हम्बल रेफ्यूजीज कमिंग इन इंडिया एंड देन स्टार्टिंग देर लाइफ रेजिंग यू लाइक हाउ टफ फॉर योर चाइल्ड and uh, how many struggles did you and your parents face like can you describe it? yeah uh, tibetan refugees when they first came to india it was 1959 uh, there was a time when china had invaded mm. tibet yeah. and there was so much of death destruction in tibet there were people of tibet were persecuted and people like my parents uh, they had to escape their own country they had to leave their family uh their homeland and come into an exile this was also the time when uh, our spiritual and political leader his holiness the dalai lama there was a danger on his life there was mm-hmm. danger on so many uh, peoples mm-hmm. so he had to escape to bet come to india seek asylum in india so for tibetan refugees coming into india 
1959, 1960, for them it it is a complete change of their life. There they were in Tibet, which is 4,000 meters above sea level. Mm -hmm. A country which is so high in altitude and thin in air, uh, almost about eight to nine months of winter. Mm -hmm. And then we're coming to India, which is a low land, and right. tropical, and so many different other diseases, mm -hmm. different ways of life, food, clothing, culture, language, everything changed for them. So I cannot imagine how difficult it must have been for them. Uh, Adjusting to the heat. Yeah, just the entire, you know, for them, it's like they were coming to a new world yeah. altogether. Right. And Tibetans had never gone outside the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And they were coming outside into a new country. And however underdeveloped India was in 1959 and 1960, for Tibetans is a complete new and modern life. Modern life with machines, um, cars, vehicles, trains, buses. Tibetans had never seen this kind of modernity in Tibet. Mm -hmm. And they knew only Tibetan. And now coming in, into India, they were f facing so many different languages. Yeah. So they were getting to know. So for them, it's a complete, you know, uh, upturn of their life. Literally and being bombarded with everything. So they were slowly uh, learning uh, uh, different languages, uh, banking system, a postal system, train, travel, and all of that. And then also having to... Uh, restart a, a life, uh, having left uh, Tibet nomadic pastoral life behind and uh, start to live a new life. And uh, uh, because they were not um, trained in any particular skill, they were given the work of road construction uh, labor okay. uh, in early uh, years of rehabilitation. So most of the Tibetan refugees worked in the Himalayas. Mm. Uh, in Ladakh, Lahore Spiti, and Sikkim, Arunachal, they worked as road construction laborers. And that's how they restarted their life. And slowly, with Government of India's help and uh, generosity of the Indian people, they were able to um, you know, restart their life in a way they, were, they, they created refugee camps where they set up their own, not only uh, farming, but uh, schools, uh, monasteries, hospitals, handicraft centers, they were able to set up. So it's been now 65 years since they've been living here in India. Sir, so my question is, uh, how does it feel like to be a refugee, to be born, to be in a country that you are born, but you are born as a refugee? How, how does it feel? Yeah, so here there are two ways of problem. One is that you are not only a refugee, Ki ab, uh, you know, you're, you're born a refugee. Yeah. You know, there are refugees who escape a country yeah. and go to a new country. Exactly. My parents did that. Yeah. But I'm born in India, exactly. educated here, raised here, and, and, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a refugee. Uh, so it's a very unique kind of a situation where you have no memory of the country you are supposed to have left behind. Yeah. And for me, I'm the second generation. For me and my generation, we have inherited memory of Tibet from our parents. Now there is the third generation growing up in schools and colleges whose parents had also never seen Tibet. You see, what is passing through us is a narrative, uh, a story that Tibet was free and independent. China invaded and occupied and they have lost. But majority of the Tibetans are still inside Tibet under the Chinese occupation. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's a life freedom struggle that is going on. While for us as refugees, um, we have to see, make sure that we don't lose the narrative, that we don't lose our culture. And that in itself is a struggle. Exactly. See, talking about your courage, I mean, it is literally invincible and unflinching determination which you have fighting for Tibet. So, like, how did you harvest all of this? Like, at what age did you particularly do this thing? Like, I'm literally amazed by your courage, you know. Like, I'm no, like, you're literally one man standing, you know. So, like, 
by what age all this had happened and what is the driving force who motivated you to all to do all this like mm. like what do you have See, what's your thought process i mean to right. say it for me it's everything started from my uh, grand my grandmother okay we were living in a tibetan refugee camp called kolegal it's in southernmost district of uh, karnataka karnataka state bordering tamil nadu um in a district called chamrajnagar and there is a very small village uh, where our uh, refugee camp was re- rehabilitated at so my first memory is of my grandmother telling us stories of tibet the, uh, she was telling us stories of uh, snow mountains yaks sheep apricots peach apples things that we could never see in karnataka and yet we believed in the stories that there is a country somewhere yeah, right. we cannot see we cannot go mm-hmm. but there is a country that my my grandmother left behind and that is the country we were eventually going to go back to so we believed in that story of snow mountains and yaks that then became not only the memory for us kind of a inherited memory uh but it became for us not history but our future you know that was history for my grandmother the country she left behind so this is the difference today the older generation like my parents my grandparents for them tibet is a memory they are nostalgic about their memory of the tibet they left behind but for us because we have no direct memory of that for us tibet is our future that's the country we have to go back to and therefore we have to work hard our education our training our skill our youth our our entire career everything has to do with tibet's future if you can make it we have a future if you cannot make it we have no future So you see it's very different for two different generations. Yeah. Very often this new generation is always being asked you have never seen Tibet what do you know about Tibet yeah, yeah? yeah. and humko aise bhi bole jate hain ki uh tum Tibet ke bare mein kya jante ho and why do you feel so much we we do because that's our future. We are we, we are born and raised in India but culturally we can say we are Indian culturally because buddhism from he is from from here our script has been adapted from brahmi script so there are a lot of uh, similarities between tibetan culture and indian culture overlapping kind of many yeah but we still insist on saying we are tibetan we have to go back to our own country one day and that's a duty right there's a it's a struggle of, there's a sense of identity attached to identity attached to it and the struggle gives us the identity yeah no mm. so therefore this this persistence with which we 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 uh, engage in the struggle and the determination with which we want to achieve this goal of returning to our country uh, in itself gives us a meaning of life ki hamare liye ek career nahi hai hamare liye paise banana important nahi hai hamare liye नाम कमाना इम्पोर्टेंट नहीं है हमारे लिए इस संघर्ष को अपनी उस मुकलमे मुकलमे तक पहुंचाना दैट इज इम्पोर्टेंट फॉर अस सो फॉर अस द स्ट्रगल गिव्स अस दिस सेंस ऑफ आइडेंटिटी एंड एंड द स्ट्रगल गिव्स अस दैट मीनिंग ऑफ लाइफ लेट जस्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट स्ट्रगल सो हाउ डू थिंक दैट टिबेटेंस आर स्ट्रगलिंग टूडे अंडर चाइना and what do you think like what is the current political situation in tibet and like let's just say like can you give your experience how the people of tibet are suffering like basically for the past 70 years can you give a no- take on this yes uh in 1997 after my graduation i went to tibet yeah i was 22 years old and the reason i why i went to tibet at the time when many tibetans were escaping tibet and coming to india tibetan freedom fighters who had never known the freedom in india 
They have never known the support we are getting in India and different other countries. They have no idea. And yet they don't give up. See, their imagination of support and freedom, I, I cannot imagine where do they seek inspiration. When it's so limited for them. And I said to myself that I am so fortunate that I'm born in India. I have so much of opportunities to study, educate and learn uh, whatever I needed from the entire world. And there they were in Tibet, in Lhasa jail, incarcerated and killed. So in the jail I have seen how difficult it is for them. Not just physically being tortured, beaten, killed. Not just that. But mentally, how China is trying to colonize the mind of people, taking away people's hope and reigning on the people with this leash of fear. And those who are fearless, they will try to lure them in greed. So I've seen uh, this level of torture and inca incarceration in jail. After uh, uh, you know coming back, I should say being thrown out. You know, I I didn't come back on my own. I was actually yeah. taken to so many different places by the Chinese security, and finally I was thrown out uh, back to uh, Ladakh border in 1997. So after coming back, I went to Bombay for my uh, post graduation. I wanted, I wanted to study literature. And for two years, I sat and kept on thinking, what had happened with me? How was I sent back? And the humiliation that you went to your own homeland and the Chinese arrested, beaten, tortured you and threw you out of your own country. The humiliation. Right. It was it was sad. At the same time, the humiliation was more unbearable. That you have to go to your country So I kept on thinking, how do I come back from here? I thought of going back again. I tried also. Didn't work. Then I had to settle down to my second option, which was to work from exile for Tibet. So you see, what is happening in Tibet today, or in those years of like 60, now 65 years of exile, and also 70 years of Chinese invasion. In such a long period of time, what China has done is China has killed more than one-sixth of Tibetan population. We, we lost almost about 10 lakh Tibetans under Chinese occupation. They, were, they died of starvation, famine, uh, torture, overworked, and also execution, public execution, in order to set example to the rest of the people. Uh, many Tibetans, they died in prison. And this is just the population. China cut much of the trees in southern part of Tibet. Mm -hmm. Southern part of Tibet, bordering Nepal, Bhutan, Arunachal, is very thick vegetation. Much of the trees were cut and complete clear felling of forest and took them to China to sell to the rest of the world. Now they are damming Tibetan rivers. Rivers from Tibet feed almost about 1.5 billion people in Asia. It's the biggest freshwater source yes. in the world. Yes. And there, they're damming. And dams are being build, built in Tibet, but the electricity goes to China. They're mining. They are bombing mountains and, 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 and pasture land and valleys. Mining. They're mining copper, gold, and most importantly, lithium. And these go into feeding Chinese uh, cheap made in China production. 
and they are selling it to countries around the world. So, in this, uh, they are destroying Tibetan environment. For them, it is just a colonial policy with which they want to take advantage of the dictatorship and Chinese occupation. They are taking away this. And in process, Tibetan nomads, farmers are losing land. They are losing their culture. They are, they are now being resettled in uh, artificial villages. So, Tibetan nomads and farmers are now becoming dishwashers in Chinese restaurants. So, there is so much of attack on Tibetan culture. Another important aspect is uh, the attack on Tibetan culture, uh, especially Buddhism, during the Cultural Revolution. Of course, yeah. the destruction happened all over China, mm -hmm. but in extension, what happened in Tibet was they destroyed more than 6,000 monasteries. monasteries. Some of the key important monasteries were destroyed. So, therefore, the monasteries in the Himalayas, in Ladakh, in Arunachal, have now become older compared to monasteries in Tibet because the old monasteries in Tibet are now destroyed. There are only one or two left. That too, just for, for them, for China, to, uh, as, a, as a symbolism. But most of the key important monasteries were destroyed. And uh, and later, only after 1985, um, 86, they were rebuilt. That also, I think, the Chinese way. They didn't build it the traditional way. So, you know, it's, it's a struggle mm -hmm. how the Tibetans are trying to keep uh, mm -hmm. their arts, architecture in the Tibetan manner. Uh, and, and China, in order to uh, claim their control over Tibet, they are trying to synthesize, give Chinese characteristics on Tibetan language, mm. culture, monastery, different other aspects. Now, the latest policy that they are now uh, unleashing in Tibet is the language policy. China says it's a dual language policy, where China is saying uh, every, what is called the minority, has their own right to practice their language and culture, but they must also know Chinese. Uh, Mandarin. So, they are teaching everybody Mandarin. So, then what happens is the uh, Tibetan children at very young age are forcibly sent to uh, boarding schools. Now, we are seeing uh, there is this uh, study that had come from uh, Tibet Actions where they are saying more than a million Tibetan children are uh, forcibly sent to these Chinese set up uh, uh, boarding schools where they are given Chinese education. So, we can see in the next they 10, are, 20 years, they are trying to Tibetan rewrite children, the history. Tibetan children will not be able to speak their own mother tongue. Yeah, exactly. This is the uh, sinicization mm -hmm. effect that China, China is trying to uh, bring into Tibet, and it's not just in Tibet. In China's other occupied countries. Yeah. Xinjiang province. Yes, yeah. what is called Xinjiang yeah. is actually East Turkestan, is yeah. the country yeah. of the yeah. Uyghur people. Uyghur yeah. people. Yeah. And then um, uh, Mongolia. Yeah. yeah, Mongolia. Outer Mongolia is free and independent, mm. but inner Mongolia mm. is under Chinese occupation. There also they are practicing this. In fact, in inner Mongolia, the efficacy is much more. They introduced Chinese language much, much earlier. The resistance was much more in Tibet and therefore now they are targeting Tibetan language and culture. They knew that if they bring about uh, military rule, you know, crude military rule, people were resisting that more. So therefore now they are they have resorted to targeting language and culture, which they see is the most, uh, you know, potent Tibetan uh, resistance. I want to take, I want to know your take on the current Chinese Communist Party. Like, do you think that the world will ever see the downfall of the CCP? And if yes, how? Um, you see, Chinese Communist Party founded in 1920. It came out with, it started um, with this great idealism that there should be uh, equality that there should be justice, there should be freedom, 
the basic idea is that of freedom and fight against imperialism and uh, aristocracy uh, feudalism it started with that yeah. idea yeah. marxist uh, idea and then it went into a power struggle right. mao zedong uh, raised uh, a militant uh, struggle against the then ruling party the nationalists so china's history was marked by civil war between the communists and the nationalists ever since they started the party they were successful because they uh, recruited huge number of what is called the mao's the red army and with that they were able to defeat the nationalists the nationalists were supported by the americans and the the chinese communist party was supported by the russians, russians. as usual what what China, what united states and and russia is doing in in central europe uh, in ukraine yeah. was happening in china so the nationalists they were defeated they uh, went to uh, to taiwan now taiwan, yeah, taiwan used to be called formosa yeah. uh, republic of china so you see uh, chinese communist party was successful in uh, defeating the nationalists creating people's republic of china uh, under mao zedong's uh, leadership and yet it continued to build uh, you know god like figure out of mao zedong which was never yeah. communist or socialist in nature people worshiping and mao zedong was son of a farmer so son of a farmer who fought for equality and justice ended up becoming an emperor unquestioned emperor and he was so powerful in a way that he was defeating every point in his career as a leader that he was defeating literally killing right. all kind of uh, you know op uh, oppositions against him right till his death he remains unquestioned uh, emperor a kind of a dictator this module became the module for chinese leadership which continues even today yeah. so chinese communist party the name continues even today and uh, uh, the government they created people's republic of, republic of china in 1949 yeah soon they are going to celebrate 100 years the yeah. communist party itself has already celebrated 100 years but what what we see today is nothing communist about it there is nothing socialist about it it has become the most brutal capitalist feasting on people's freedom right. and now they have created a a a, 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 a society in china where people have cultured uh, a system where uh, questioning uh, freedom of people they have given up upon right is no more a, no no more a culture there the culture is uh, servitude the culture is uh, uh, is silence and uh the culture is fear and this is what is uh, going on in china where in china if you don't question the government then you can make any amount of money right so uh, money has ended up becoming the uh, religion there it's very sad to see that 1.5 billion population of the world which is 1/7 of world population is in such a state right. therefore i have always wondered when would the people of china ever stand and speak for themselves they tried in 1989 yeah, there was a yeah. tiananmen square massacre yeah. and subsequently in many other places and uh, last year was again a new highlight when uh, after the zero covid policies which became unbearable for yeah. the people people started to question uh even demanded 
uh, Xi Jinping and also Communist Party to go. Um, it was not successful, but nonetheless, um, some people in China made that call. So it is a latent, uh, you know, a, a possible revolution which may be a dormant, which may be a stalled, but I believe that people of China will rise up one day and fight for their own freedom. But you know, there is Ukraine, sorry, there is Russia, there is Iran. Iran is little suffering under Ayatollah Khopini. Russia is suffering under Putin. And you know, even China has been suffering for the past 60 to 70 years since the CCP. But they are very, like they are very, you know, aggressive people. Like we want to, we want to have freedom in our country, we want to have democracy. But they have been fighting for a lot of times. But since we have not seen any significant results, so do you think there will be, there has to be a bloodshed for this to happen? Like, do you think the Chinese people will gain so like democracy, freedom with bloodshed? Like, do you think that there will be a mass outrage? Like, and or do you think there has to be an external aggression? Like, the say countries attacking China for China to become democratic? Yeah. Gone at the times where because the people are always suppressed, you know. Right. So what I'm saying is, there was a point of time when in the world a revolution is a country's problem. A war is a is a struggle between two countries. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, whether it's a revolution or a war, everything is global. And China is a very good model to study that. If there is a revolution in China, the world will be affected. If China enters into any kind of war, it will be third world war. Right. Easily. But let us see, how has, has it come to this? China's authoritarian rule, led by Xi Jinping today, has been aided, created by the West. What the West is now complaining that there is no freedom, no democracy. It was the West who created China into the industry of the world. The West needed a place where the West doesn't have to dirty their hands yeah. in producing mass industrial products. The West doesn't have to dirty their backyard, their environment in the way China is doing in China. The West doesn't have to disenfranchise their population like the way China is has been using their own population at such a cheap labor cost no labor rights ridiculously cheap impossible to think the kind of labor situation either in Europe or America and Australia or Japan or even in India India may agar laborers ko kuch problem hai to pura desh strike karke bitha sakte hain china is just the opposite in china uh, uh, labor organizations are created by the government so that they could rule over or control the uh, laborers so the dictatorship in china has been created by the west they needed a place a country who would continue to produce cheap made in China products and they could buy and this nixus between the Chinese Communist Party and the Western capitalists this has been going on for almost about 30 years it is America who created China into this now we have to see that this labor camp industry of the world has become a power that is now aiming to topple United States as the superpower of the world. Yeah. So United States has now uh, has issues to deal with. Right. So you see, they feel that the Western order of democracy, human rights, may not be the order uh, if if China is successful. So let we have to see where is this going to go to. I think if the West can deal with China's economy, which is China's Achilles heel. Yeah. If the West can deal with Chinese economy, there is a possibility of bringing a revolution in China. There has to be a but I think technically, where the problem lies is China's 
uh, propaganda machinery. China's propaganda machinery has created two worlds. The world within China and the world outside China. The world outside China has many narratives. The world within China has single narrative. The one who has single narrative is larger in population, which is 1.7, no, 4 billion. But outside, everybody's opinion is different. Japan would look at differently. Indians would look at China differently. Everybody looks at China differently. So you see, if you actually look at uh, the ratio of uh, population, who has what kind of narratives, Chinese uh, population with single narratives wins. Therefore, it is extremely difficult to implant the idea of individual rights, freedom and democracy in China. Chinese people today cannot think that by voting they can vote Xi Jinping out of the, of, of, of the government, while we can. Mm. In India mm. or in America or anywhere. Who, however popular, powerful the presidents are, in a democracy, people can vote out uh, however popular or powerful the president or prime minister is. But in China, people cannot imagine. So what is what is Chinese Communist Party, what is the dictatorship in China has done to the people is people's imagination has been erased, cancelled and nullified. People have no imagination of another free and democratic China. This is the biggest disservice the government has done to the people. Talking about the West, you know, an invasion of Taiwan by China is creating an uproar in the entire world that the US is committed to go to war against China for defending Taiwan, you know, regarding the semiconductor industry because it disrupts the global market chains. But the but an invasion of a peaceful country of Tibet that also decades ago does not create any uh, emergency you know like there are no uh, approaches or no let's just say any concerns regarding Tibet so do you think the West is being hypocritical and diplomatic with, it to, with their approach towards China like how much do you think is the West being really let's just say greasing the palm of China in terms of moral rights of course the entire West must not only support but they have uh, responsibility to support freedom and democracy and human rights uh, for Tibet. But they won't. Because changes that move the world is the economic leverage, not moral uh, responsibility. Yeah. And Taiwan today matters. Taiwan's economy, Taiwan's technology, and that too, um, uh, Taiwan has become the litmus test uh, for the West uh, against China. Uh, and particularly because now China is a threat to the Western order. Uh, there was a point of time in 1960s uh, when issue of Tibet came at the United Nations. Some of the anti-communist countries, they sponsored uh, resolutions on Tibet in the United Nations. For example, in 1959, 63, 65, three important resolutions were passed in the United Nations for Tibet. And they're too calling for self-determination rights for the Tibetan people. And there was a time when China was not a member um, at the United Nations. Uh, at the UNO, um, the representation was made by Taiwan at yeah, the time, Republic yeah. of, Ta uh, of Republic of China. The, yes, uh, at the time. Main, so main therefore, main. the the resolutions were passed for Tibet at the United Nations in those years. Now we have come to a point of time where people have not only given up on the uh, you know sovereign right of the Tibetan people. They've uh, you know uh, you know um, l left Tibet to Tibetan people's own destiny. And not only that, they've taken advantage of Chinese dictatorship, occupation of Tibet, and they continue to benefit from China's mining and cheap made in China production, trade to the Western countries. They've benefited at the cost of Tibetan people to a point that Chinese mining occupation uh, has been driving Tibet 
almost to the point of genocide. Yet the West continue to benefit from this. They, therefore, they must own this accountability to what they have done for their commercial benefits, what they have done uh, uh, on the Tibetan people for, of their own religion, culture. So, therefore, I have always spoken uh, that West, uh, you know, uh, must own this this responsibility, and they have, uh, you know, uh, respons responsibility to to now work for uh, the freedom of Fort Tibet. But we will see how this is going to pan out because I think uh, when it comes to uh, China, Taiwan, United States, and other countries. It is not just the military uh, and economy. There are many other factors. And unless we get to see other factors coming uh, on, onto the surface, we cannot immediately judge how this is going to shape the world. So you have just raised a question of how important it is for West to raise this concern. So what are your thoughts on America and the Biden government dealing with the Russia-Ukraine war and how do you think it should deal with diplomatically with China? What, what are your thoughts on this? You know, some people are right in saying that the real beneficiary in this uh, Ukraine war uh, is, is China. How China has created a, a kind of an alliance with uh, Russia and and received uh, oil supply, natural gas supply from Russia to whatever infinity uh, you know period in future. Mm -hmm. um, at at the same time, not having to spend money uh, on the war, and therefore reserved uh, their their diplomacy on this. You know, uh, you know, I'm someone who is ag uh, who's against war. Right. I believe, uh, like. Our leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, has always said, any kind of human conflict should be, must be resolved by dialoguing. But at the moment, it is not about solving the situation, solving the uh, problem in U Ukraine. It is about the supremacy, uh, what Putin wants to uh, show, and what the West uh, want to show. Do you think Biden has incited the war in Ukraine? I cannot say. Uh, that everything can be blamed on one person. War happened because of many other factors and everybody should uh, own the responsibility. Yeah. But America has been, you know, profiting a lot from the years of Ukraine before because Russia is getting weakened day in and day out with their long involvement since the war. It's like been over one year, almost one year. The so war? America is profiting a lot from this, you know. It's a, it's a way of saying, but many other people also benefited out of this, uh, yeah. diplomatically, yeah. politically, economically, and, uh, and alliance building also. So, uh, wars are fought today uh, mainly because of many people's contribution in, in, into this and cannot be blamed on one, um, one party. Yeah. Do you think it's uh, for, uh, for Putin, the war he has initiated, do you think it's kind of a... a uh, showing the world is muscle flexing or like showing his ideology and saying that we are not you know like sitting here and will not do nothing if we want to do something we'll do it no matter what happens then this is a way like Putin is showing this to the world well I think that is the ugly part of uh, the world, politics. world politics today uh, instead of showing uh, really smart and uh, sophisticated diplomacy uh, by solving uh, a yeah. situation uh, in in more intelligent manner, uh, you want to muscle flex yeah. and show missiles and things like that. It's a really ugly, and some of the most powerful countries have involved in this. So I don't know where it, uh, people's intelligence is going to uh, lead the entire world to, and therefore, uh, His Holiness has always said that it is the leaders leaders who can be intelligent, but they need more warm-hearted. They need more kindness. If the leaders are kind, then they will try to solve problems differently. Mm -hmm. They can be very intelligent, very smart, highly educated. But if there is no kindness, they will lead the world into a third world war and <laughs> everybody will suffer. So, uh, so 
actually um, it's not too useful if the leaders are too smart or sophisticated or over over educated if they are not kind enough which global politician do you think has dealt with china the best current or former in your opinion which global politician it's difficult to say uh to point out one because different people dealt with china differently uh, the one feeling the most for dependence like this is what i mean to say i cannot say because um no prime minister or president uh, would deal with china on tibet issue uh, in fact uh, their own national policy is prior, prior importance whether it's uh, in the indian prime minister or australian prime minister uh where there is we have seen um, uh, a, a huge change uh before covid and after covid australia uh, uh, japan for, for example shinzo abe uh, did it in a in a very yeah. different way and trump dealt it dealt uh, xi jinping in a different way and now is uh, biden so all of them actually uh, they look at their own uh, national policies and some some can be more confrontational some use uh, more technology so i would think that it was shinzo abe who who did it in a little more uh, smart and more careful manner um, that he not only prepared his own country but he was able to uh uh withdraw some of the um, uh, key uh technology uh, industries and uh you know uh, diversify not only investments but also production units and uh, strengthen his country from inside and also created that kind of alliance um so i i would be more biased towards uh, shinzo abe uh, but again you know he, he has done actually nothing for tibet so therefore i'm saying you know tibet is not a measure yeah. uh to deal with uh, with china um i think what what is needed uh, today is uh, although it's a globalized world uh, now uh, people are thinking more uh, swaraj if it is technology if it is technical defense uh, they want themselves to be the producer instead of being dependent on one country and covid has proved uh, that ch- uh, dependency on china has not only Uh, made them suffer economically but um, technically and strategically falling dependent on china and now that after covid uh, china has actually become kind of um, uh, adversary at least to say in many cases even hostile uh, that that uh, much of europe is dependent on china's uh, supply chain and if china stops the supply chain those countries will stop production india for example we have atman nirbhar very strong policy but we are still dependent on china supply chain and it will take if, at least about 10 years to be really self reliant so atman atman nirbhar ki technology ke madhyam se wo pura sampurna atman nirbhar banne mein khas karke china ke jo nirmit utpad hai we will take more time so you see this actually shows how unwise we were you know 15 20 uh, years ago and i'm not talking about political parties i'm talking about india you know um so we we have we have to see how, where this is going to uh, lead us uh, into um so although it is a globalized world uh, most of production are the same same kind of products are sold all around the world um, but now countries are choosing to uh, strategically self reliant do you think like you talk you just talked about covid you know so do you think china has attacked every single country at all at the same time by waging war like by waging covid you know by unleashing covid to onto the whole world do you think this is china's propaganda of destroying the global economy no i am not someone who believe in uh, you know uh, that kind of a narrative uh, what i see or how i look at this is china has innately created a system to hide facts to continue to show that they are doing the best that they are right 
whatever decision they make it is correct so therefore when the first few cases of covid happened in china china tried to hide them to such a way that uh, the most important doctor who uh, diagnosed yeah. that unique uh, case uh, he was silenced and he he later died in in chinese police custody right so that was a crucial moment for not only china but international community to know and prepare so what could have been just uh, an epidemic in china because they were hiding the facts for almost about 2 to 3 months by then the disease has already spread to the world and who did a huge disservice by completely believing what the chinese government was saying that for a longest period of time china kept on saying that there are no evidence of human to human transfer even when taiwan had already said that this is spreading from human to human world uh, who disregarded that report and continued to believe in what the china was saying this was a crucial moment for china to uh, cap um, the disease within the country and also for international community to prepare for it by the time the who said that this is actually transmitting from human to human it had already gone to the west especially um, spain and uh, italy and then to united states so you see i think what uh, what china attempted to hide uh, its own illness its own disease and i'm not just talking about covid the disease of hiding uh, mistakes within uh, the party that uh, is what the world had to pay for and it became uh, a pandemic do you think this was a mistake or a planned out strategic strategy it's too early to say anything like this uh, people do say that this is a uh, a virus created in a lab and all of that yeah, because do you think of that thing i have no you know real way of knowing knowing this uh but what people also say that this is not a, a natural virus yeah uh so it may be uh, an unnatural virus um i'm sure a lot of things are still being hidden by united states by china and by many other parties so i think it will come out later or it may never come out what was the real source of the virus and um, you know but many people have said that the virus was part of a chinese virologist uh, lab and uh, either it escaped or it was an accident or some was trying to uh, you know take it to a different place and something happened but it was all blamed on uh, a fish market there wuhan wuhan market yeah. what do you think about trump like uh, let's just say he can you think sorry what's your thoughts on trump being elected in 2024 do you think like trump will be a better president than biden i have no idea i you know i, uh, I i'm i'm too uneducated to talk about uh, the possibilities like, like who has been the toughest pre- president to attack china to counter china in your opinion any who has been very stern against china whether modi whether trump whether biden whether any global politician i would still say shinzo abe was really uh, yeah mm-hmm. uh, he did he he dealt with china in the most smartest manner uh, i wish in india um, that much more preparedness Uh, must have been done uh, before 2020 galvan uh, so it was such a surprise yeah. it shouldn't been a surprise our intelligence especially uh, should have forewarned or should have foreseen that such kind of uh, you know clash was li- was going to happen uh, in galvan because just 6 months ago uh, we had the summit in chennai and when we had such a successful summit no one saw what was going to happen in galwan 6 months later mm-hmm. and um, in in chennai summit i went there to protest i got arrested i was in chennai jail for 12 days mm-hmm. at that time i told the police inspector that enemy is not me 
It is, it is the Chinese president. And he was laughing. How can I go and arrest the Chinese yeah, president? Exactly. But that was the time when Xi Jinping was, uh, was coming to India. But Chinese PLA soldiers were already in Ladakh. And Indian soldiers were trying to drive them out. So Xi Jinping had already done that. Yeah. And for Xi Jinping, it's not a, this was not an accident. It always happens by design. Whenever Xi Jinping came to India three times, uh, Ahmedabad 2014, uh, Goa BRICS Summit 2016, and Chennai uh, 2019, in all these cases, there were always the Chinese PLA soldiers entering into Indian uh, border. Border incursions had happened. But we, we kind of discounted that because we thought that you know, we, we were going to get some investments uh, from China. So I think uh, you know, these are the few places where we could have been uh, you know, much more astute, much more prepared and not completely you know, believe in, in, in the friendship that we were uh, trying. You know, we were very well meaning. We really meant uh, friendship with uh, with yeah, China, you know, investment and of all of Jawaharlal Nehru, Hindi, Chini, Bhai. Yeah. yeah. So, the, you know, between 2014 to 2019, there was almost a kind of a revival of Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I went to jail at least three times. Uh, you see, but at the time, uh, there should have been a, a counter thought in India that we can be friends, but we also should be prepared, and that didn't happen. And now, uh, you know, uh, we are too late. Uh, uh, we are scrambling in in the borders to to protect. And almost every day, there are border incursions happening and a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, according to China, it's a communist country, and Russia is also a communist country. And when the revolution was happening in 1949, the yeah. when the ROC was overthrown by PRC, so they got a lot of help through Russia to do for the weaponry and everything. So these two countries have always been together mm. some kind of the way. Yes. So what are your thoughts on the future? How how do you think the global countries or you know like India, Japan and America, the Quad group should come together and deal with these two countries? See, my solutions are very different. Um, uh, how I would... Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm even answering this question because I'm, you know, my opinion is just opinion. It's you not going to affect, global, you're yeah. Not, you're not that into global politics. Yeah, and and I'm not going to affect anybody's yeah, opinion. Yeah. Um, but how I look at it is, like, when you deal with a difficult uh, opponent, you should love your opponent to a point that you reason out or you target your opinion opponent not to fight your opinion opponent, but to love and and bring about that kind of a change. If you continue to think that Russia is enemy, China is enemy, then you are fighting and they will fight you more. I, I would, if I have to fight China, I mean, that's, look, look at how His Holiness is saying, the Dalai Lama is saying, China is not enemy. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama is saying, China is also a country. They are a country of 1.4 billion. And in 2008, when the uh, Olympics was going on, when we were going out to protest, yeah. His Holiness said, China deserves good Olympics. And that's how yeah. he was able to, uh, you know, assuade international, uh, you know, leadership to allow China to have that kind of uh, uh, Olympics at the time when Chinese um, police were killing Tibetan uh, protesters inside Tibet. Um, it's too difficult to, uh, you know, for me as an individual who has very little capacity, uh, not be able to understand the Dalai Lama's wisdom and, and love and compassion, uh, to see how it works. But after 20 years, uh, you know, I still think um, that you should never fight uh, your enemy. Uh, one can disarm your enemy. Well, yeah. It's a great analogy. So I just have a point. Uh, so let's just say if it's on you if you don't yeah. want to answer. What if you come into the political frame? If mm. you are elected, and mm. how would you deal with China? No, I'm <laughs> I'm always <laughs> in the activist mode. I can never be. Well, uh, well in, actually, uh, yeah, I I yeah. Can, I I get your question. Yeah. Um, but 
how I think and where I am is always the, the activist mind. Um, uh, uh, taking initiatives, at the same time uh, reacting, uh, both. Uh, but I think, you know, um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, leadership, when it comes to dif uh, dealing with a difficult uh, enemy or what is the adversary, uh, if you and, and, and you know that the other other enemy is uh, is always likely to retaliate in the way they are good at, uh, like China or or, or Putin. Um, so in that way, um, I I think it is it, it is wiser for international leadership to deal with them in a different manner. Um, uh, deconstruct the leaders and not look at Russia as enemy or China as enemy. Uh, look at different components differently and you can, you can, for example, you can talk to your legs differently, you can talk to your eyes differently, you can talk to the heart and the poetry and possibility of your music and, you know, talk to uh, your, your palate differently, maybe give you um, a different kind of food uh, and then talk to to your to your muscles to your pens differently. I think deconstructing the enemy and not look at the enemy as one big holistic point. I have a very tough question to ask you, but do you think that China can be influenced by journalist reformers or like let's just say like you or even by an army of journalists or pro protesters in in uh, influencing let's just say in persuading by being persuaded by the influences or religious protesters to free debate. Like, do you think China even cares about any journalist? Leave alone you. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, idea is not to look at China as one composite China. We should look at China as its population, its yeah. overseas people, yeah. its leadership, its intellectuals, and also um, the Chinese who want truly and working for democracy, they who have been jailed in China. So you see, when you look at China in different pockets, then it's possible. I meant the CCP. Like, do you, do you think the CCP can be influenced by Even protesters? The CCP, there are how many there are not bastards, honestly. No, that's that's how you how you no make, see make see. I I am someone who has been totally into J politics for a very yeah. long period of time, yeah. honestly. Yeah. I've been vastly uh, like interested in politics and you know global politics or whatever it may be, control controversy, like whatever whatever you can call it. So, why do you think that CCP, let's just say the Chinese government? So basically, you are saying that you want to turn their hearts, like you know, you want to change their uh, like persona, right? This is what you want to say? No, I'm saying I I'm not saying I want to do it yeah. because I have I have no capacity. Yeah. What I'm saying is there can be. Uh, a different ways of working and today the single factor that is standing between us and the different pockets of China is the inside and outside China worlds okay and that too marked by China's uh, firewall China has very effectively strategically created a world within China, the world outside China. The world within China speaks in Chinese. The world outside speaks million different languages. And they don't understand the million different languages. So China has, uh, the, the, the Chinese government has, especially the CCP, has created these two worlds by not only dividing the inside and outside uh, world of China by firewalling, but also by dictatorially ruling over them in Chinese language, which the world doesn't understand and they don't understand world languages. So, if there is Elon Musk or someone who is good in technology, they must create a technology with which they can bypass the firewall and send them the, op the different opinions of the world in Chinese language. Why should the 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 Chinese government, the the uh, you know Xi Jinping government or the or the CCP, rule over the imagination of the Chinese people, just because they have Chinese language and just because they have created the firewall? Why is why is that impenetrable? Why the entire world has created so much of technology? Why is nobody working on that? Is there 
<clears throat> an interest for the Western world to keep that composite ruled by China so that they can continue to produce cheap made in China products. Why America still is dependent almost of 90 to 95 percent of Chinese products in America are from China. There may be an interest for, for America to maybe outwardly look as if they are taunting uh, Xi Jinping, but continue to rule over uh, the Chinese people by making them uh, work like slaves for America. Otherwise, why wouldn't America have that kind of a technology? They haven't even banned TikTok. This is, this is the stance on China. But they're not even discussing it. It's like the Great Wall of China, which is around China, but it's also in, inside the mind, minds of every Chinese. There are yeah. a wall which yeah. you can't bypass. Yeah. And, and Chinese uh, Xi Jinping has very easily uh, used on this and kept on saying, we are one country. Yeah. We are under threat. Yeah. America is our, uh, I'll India I'll is I'll our ask enemy. I'll question about this, but yeah. uh, uh, towards the end of uh. the podcast, uh, I have actually uh, regard exactly this uh. which you have just said. Uh. I'll ask you the question. So, do you think Xi Jinping has been the baddest, biggest president in the Chinese history so far? So, in the history of Chinese presidents, yeah, I think we sh we should look at this in a in a very different language. It is not morally bad or good, but he is the most sophisticated uh, leader with 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 which he used the constitution of china yeah. to make himself the president forever yeah. yeah he created a new narrative for china and he presented china uh, to the rest of the world as he was rising as peaceful uh, peaceful rising and then he imagined entire world trading with china uh, during this uh, belt and uh, road initiative of course, it's not working too well. Yeah. He is failing in so many different uh, places. Uh, but actually, he is uh, a dictator uh, with a wine glass. Hmm. But let's just say, through your journalism and through your protest and through your translation writings, you know, influencing people, you, I think you can influence 1.4 billion people of China. I think you can do that. But do you think your writings can influence the Chinese government as well, like the CCP? Like at the end of the day, your writings are to be impacted on the CCP. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll add one point. So, are you like writing for pointing it to the Chinese Communist Party or you're writing to point it towards the intellectuals of the Chinese or the people, the Chinese people, so they you can, you know, show them the outer world? So, what's the... Where, where is your focus on? I've never really uh, written keeping Chinese people in mind. So okay. I have... My writings are very... Actually, very few. Yeah. And whatever I've written, these are my genuine expressions of, uh, you know, things I feel for the cause, mm -hmm. how I look at uh, the Tibetan community in exile, uh, what is memory, what is culture, what is identity, and how we are trying to... Uh, you know, coming in terms with uh, modernity at the same time having to keep and preserve our culture also. So these are, um, you know, uh, contradictions that I see. These are challenges we are seeing. And I always try to tell a story. So it's a very simple kind of writing. It's not targeted against uh, or at uh, kind of a particular audience. So how, how so you have, you've been uh, fighting for the independence of Tibet for the past 25 years. So, how your experience and struggles have been so far? Like, what's the journey been? For me, yeah, for me, this has been a big roller coaster story of adventure. And I'm enjoying it. Um, as an activist, I've this has uh, taken me to jails so many times, uh, been beaten, tortured, uh, stripped naked. Went to Tihar jail twice. Okay. Um, jail, like almost about, if we, uh, if I count all these jail incidents, it comes to almost about, yeah, 16, 16, 16 times to 16, yeah. different jails. Um, and uh, at the time of going to jail, it's really frustrating that, mm. you know, you want to achieve something, a protest or a scenario or something, and suddenly everything is shut and you are 
packed you are thrown into a car and or in a bus and then police speed away then you are you know yes, shackled uh, you know um but every time when i look back into any any of those uh, you know uh, jail episodes i think this has really had a very strong impact in me in in uh, liberating myself from my own uh, sense of my 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 ego uh, my sense of uh, what is dirty what is below my standard uh, what is ugly uh, you know sleeping for example sleeping on the floor with just a shirt as my blanket you know so for me these are really liberating moments and um uh, and these are lessons real life lessons that change you uh, real changes uh more than the um, you know uh, uh going to jail uh, it is the court cases that is much more challenging where you go to court for example i went to uh, mandi uh, district court 17 times for one case my god and i had another case uh, in bangalore where i went to bangalore 27 times from here through delhi to bangalore 27 times over a period of 11 years just for one simple non violent protests up on a building where i hung a free tibet banner um so you see but in in india there are protests where people burn uh, you know government properties and they get away so you see um you, you feel that that the courts are making a bad precedence to this non violent uh, activity uh compared to the political activity that many political parties and and karyakartas uh, get away with and and when 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 a non violent freedom struggle or an activity is not given that kind of a respect or made to suffer like this it seems they are making a bad example of this so therefore people would easily resort to uh, you know political party kind of a you know uh, uh, violence where they burn government properties and destroy government properties and get away so these are for me uh, you know uh, uh, difficult moments to not because i had to undergo but because I, overall in, in india the the culture of uh, you know political activism uh, needs to be respected there will be political activism but what is the future of political activism is a non violent civil uh, protest possible today in the way gandhi did in the way lala lajpat rai led and this is this happened at the time of british why can we not have non violent civil uh, disruption or political activities in free and democratic india yeah there should be that kind of space I have a very simple question to ask you. Yeah. You have been living in India for forty-seven years. Am I right? Why don't you just acquire citizenship? No, for me, um, you know, citizenship is not important. Citizenship of India. It, it India. will impact you greatly in your quest for Tibetan independence. No, but then morally, if you are Indian, if you take Indian citizenship, if you become. Always announce it in the future. No. Then, then Tibet is not yours, yeah. Yeah, it 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 doesn't align with your vision. Yeah. I mean, can you are Indian citizen? Can you can you say ham ko Tibet ka jaat chahiye? Ab bol sakte? I'm being very practical right now. Nah, practical. I'm. Why I'm saying this? You are Indian citizen. I'm not. You. What can you say? Tibet is ours, and we need our freedom. Can you say it? No, you can't. Because it's not yours. It's mine. Right. I have a right over Tibet because my parents came from Tibet, and that is my country. I will. I can I can say. But if I take Indian citizenship. If I take, then my rights would be on India, not yeah. Tibet. So, my right, the right that is made, they go. If I become a citizen of Bharat, or of any other country, especially in Bharat, here, one citizenship policy is going on. So, if I become a citizen of Bharat, or of any other country, especially in Bharat, here, one citizenship policy is going on. So, as an Indian, you cannot demand, you cannot say, "I belong to another country." You cannot. You Uh, swear on the republic of india that is your first duty also so you tibet tibet would be your secondary but my concern is not this my thing is that uh, i want to maintain the lineage 
my parents came from Tibet, they are Tibetan, they came to uh, India as a refugee with the goal that they want to go back to that Tibet they left behind. And I want to continue this legacy of, of a free Tibet. Culturally, I am born in India. I feel I am as Indian as both of you or any Indian. Or, or sometimes I joke with my Indian friends because I speak uh, Hindi, uh, uh, English, Tibetan, Tamil. I can understand a little bit of Marathi. So, and because I have travelled all over India, so I jokingly say to many of my Indian friends, I am more Indian than you. Yes. लेकिन बात यहाँ नहीं बात इंडियनेस की कल्चर की बात नहीं हो रहा है यहाँ इस अबाउट द पॉलिटिकल यू नो मोरल ड्यूटी यू हैव फॉर टिबेट एंड द राइट यू वांट टू असर्ट ऑन टिबेट एंड एंड दैट इज माय राइट वेरी हेम्बली आस्किंग इफ यू आई एम नॉट सेइंग यू विल आई एम आई एम जस्ट सेइंग इफ यू डू इ you will not be harassed be, being in courts, you know. Yeah, sometimes. You can be in the political main. Yeah. You can be in the political mainframe as well. Why did you go into politics? You can take on China. You can influence China the way you want. You know, your principles, your ideologies, they are amazing. Are they? Are, I really respect and admire those principles which you have. Like Gandhi, not not not. But I I get that. I respect that. But don't you think if you go this way, this will be an easy journey for you? But who is asking for easy journey? I mean to say. I'm not asking. Yeah, I get that. So, so that I, I get that. I get it. So therefore, I'm saying sometimes it's not the easy uh, journey that is meaningful. It is the difficult journey that makes the journey meaningful. Yes, I get that. So therefore, for me as a Tibetan fighting for the freedom of Tibet, which is my right, is what I want to do. And I could have very easily actually acquire not just certain. Citizenship here in India, but as a refugee, I could go to Europe or America or any of those countries. But I'm not interested. I will replace. I, I could have made my life easy, but it's not about my life. It's about the future of this country. I will replace the, the word best. easy with best. Now what? Now what do you think? Hmm? I will replace the word easy with best. Don't you think it's the best solution? To me, feasible. Best, feasible. Best solution is when. See, it is uh, finally it's not the result you want to achieve; it's the journey. In the journey, when you face these difficult uh, challenges, these challenges shape you, make you. Yes. Okay, and th they will constantly tell you what is Tibet, what is being Tibetan, and this is the journey every Tibetan must undergo. So you think? Like through your activism, through your journalism, you can influence and achieve your goal of Tibet. Am I right? We all have different ways of fighting. You know, there are Tibetan Tibetans who are working as uh, Tibetan government officers. There are monks, sweater sellers, Tibetans who are in Indian Army uh, in Special Frontier Force. There are Tibetans who serve the cause of Tibet in a very different way, and I do in my own way. And therefore, I'm saying every Tibetan must undergo this difficult challenging journey and this will make them what kind of tibetan they are do you think non violence alone can get the job done i am, am someone who believes that non violence is more powerful than than any essence of uh, violence yes. violence mein aisa lag raha hai ki unhone kuch karke dikhaya hmm. lekin wo tumhare ahankar hai लेकिन रियलिटी में क्या होता है कि वो वायलेंट वो वायलेंट स्टेप वो वायलेंट काम करने से पहले तुम अपने ये जो ह्यूमैनिटी जो है उसको तोड़ना पड़ेगा उसको खराब करना पड़ेगा अनलेस योर 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 ह्यूमैनिटी इज 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 नॉट डिस्ट्रॉयड फ्रॉम इनसाइड यू कैन नॉट डू यू नो यू यू नो यू यू ऑलरेडी डिस्ट्रॉयड मैन when you take up a, a violent um, a path when you take a violent uh, step to hurt someone to harm someone you know how it is going to affect them because you have you are you are also human being you have the capacity to suffer so therefore knowingly causing that of harm and hurt on someone you have to kill your humanity first right so how much destruction had you had already caused on yourself 
बिफोर यू कॉज एनी वायलेंस ऑन अदर्स और हम ये नहीं करना चाहते हैं वो हमारा कल्चर भी नहीं है बिल्कुल अगर आप अपने कल्चर को अनदेखा करें रक्त करें और कहीं और रास्ते में चले गए तो आप आप नहीं है विद 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 सो मच ऑफ एफर्ट द डिपेंडेंस रिसीव्ड बुद्धिज्म फ्रॉम इंडिया दैट सिविलाइज अस नाउ वी हैव अक्वायर्ड अ कल्चर व्हिच इज बेस्ड ऑन बुद्धिज्म व्हिच इज बेस्ड ऑन लव एंड कंपैशन एंड विद एवरी चैलेंजेस वी फेस्ड we face invasion from uh, from mongolia we face invasion from manchuria we are now facing china if we if we think that fighting with violence uh, will give us this kind of a result we are wrong. we are here survived all these because non violence the culture of love and compassion has given us a stronger uh, method or a culture it has made us stronger that we had not only uh, lived through mongolian genghis khan uh, empire manchu qing uh, qing dynasty Chinese. empire and now the chinese look at this in 70 years of chinese invasion and occupation of tibet china has destroyed their own culture they have become a country of money making but we have not lost our culture of love and compassion today we are teaching chinese the basic facets of buddhism it is tibetan lamas who are teaching chinese millionaires unhone apni culture tod diya lekin unhone hamara culture tod nahi paaye kyunki for us this is our civilization the culture of love and compassion is not in love of a civilization this is culture it is our identity उसके हर छोड़ के हम कहीं नहीं जाएंगे 